Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Neil Ross. I'm Managing Director of National Sales with Nine Point Partners. And it is my great pleasure to welcome everyone uh, to our update on our Nine Point Energy Fund strategy. Um, we've entitled this update from Eric as the Generational Opportunity in Energy Stocks. And uh, I don't know if you can see him on the screen yet, but we have as our featured speaker, as advertised, Eric Nuttall, who's a partner with our firm and, of course, also a senior portfolio manager. Before I hand things over to Eric, I just want to remind everyone about who Nine Point is and what we do. Uh, between our assets under management and our institutional business, uh, we are uh, managing approximately $8.2 billion in assets. Um, our raison d'etre, our goal when we get up in the morning, is to offer you building blocks for your portfolios that are things that you know often are maybe hard for you to do yourself as an investment advisor or portfolio manager or things that you either can't, maybe can't do yourself due to the nature of the investment strategy and to uh, ultimately give you portfolio building blocks that have uh, either little correlation to traditional stocks and bonds or lower correlation to traditional stocks and bonds. And our goal is not to do that just simply as, a, as an exercise, but to do it to have a real outcome to your overall portfolio performance and to, and to uh, you know, contribute um, by using our mandates and products to having better risk-adjusted returns for the investors. Um, we have a long track record of managing uh, funds in three broad categories. Uh, one of them is alternative income, so that would include our private debt funds. Um, the final one is, of course, alternative core strategies, uh, so that would be our unconstrained bond mandates or our FX strategy fund. And then, of course, the one we're talking about today would be real assets, uh, which would be the energy fund and uh, and things like the nine point flow through. Um, and then we have at the bottom of the screen, obviously a statement that is near and dear to our hearts. Uh, we create and manage alternative investment solutions that allow investors to realize the real tangible benefits of better diversification. Eric, at this point, I'm gonna turn things over to you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'll uh, give you Eric Nuttall. You bet. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, the goal of today is really to talk about two primary themes. One is to reinforce why we believe we're in a multi-year bull market for oil. We'll, we'll redefine what exactly that means. Essentially, we think we're in at least a five- to six-year cycle that will lead to uh, higher energy prices. We define that as $100 or higher. And then the second extension to that is why do we still think, even, we've had, even though we've had tremendous performance for the past few years, why and how can energy stocks still represent a generational opportunity? How, can it, how is it possible that in many examples you can get 10, 15, 20, even 30 years of free cash flow, i.e. dividends, for absolutely nothing? And we're going to talk about how energy ignorance remains very, very pervasive, uh, despite some of the uh, potential lessons we have happening in Europe right now. And then we're going to end off the conversation in terms of what is the catalyst to drive the re-rating, something that many of us have been uh, very patient on. I can, I can feel patience uh, among some uh, being lost. And it is the meaningful return of capital back to shareholders. Much of this year has been about deleveraging, getting the balance sheet into uh, externally good shape. You know, management teams, boards still suffering from PTSD from 2020. And so we see that healing process of leverage being uh, arrived at this year, meaning for next year we'll define this with uh, specific granularity how we think that the sector is ready to give us back more than 50% of free cash flow. And we'll, we'll tell you exactly okay, well, what does that mean. We are inundated on a daily basis by, by headlines. Uh, we're told uh, of things that uh, apparently matter that should not and things that should matter, which we uh, are not presented with. Uh, the market now, we've suffered um, the most significant drawdown uh, since March, April of 2020 in, in energy stocks, we've re recovered some of that. We've had oil sell off from approximately 120, 125 down to uh, floor of about 80. We've recovered some of those losses uh, since. And so why have we sold off? Very clearly, the market is concerned about a recession. It looks at uh, energy costs skyrocketing parts of the world. It looks as a Fed, which in you know, 50 minutes time is set to increase interest rates yet again. Uh, effectively needing to force a recession to control interest rates, uh, or inflation rather. Uh, 
uh, it is concerned about a China still pursuing a COVID uh, zero policy, what that means for lockdowns and energy demand, et cetera. And so there's, there's a tremendous amount of fear. We have in the past, and you continue to use fear as an acronym that stands for false evidence that appears real. Much of those concerns are warranted very clearly. We are likely heading towards a recession in geographies around the world. That is not shocking to anybody. But specifically, what does that mean for oil? And what does it mean for energy stocks by extension? What compass do we use to navigate through this environment of like off the charts of volatility, both in stocks and in the oil price? It has been and it remains and it will remain oil inventories because that is the, the nexus between supply and demand. And it's what supports the idea that's been championed from some, men some mentors like Mike Rothman at Cornerstone Analytics. He was one of the first uh, people that taught me many, many years ago just to focus on inventories. And we are in a period of time now where the financial demand for oil has weakened due to those fears of a recession and the impact on oil demand, et cetera. And yet the physical demand for oil remains fine. It's not great. You know, we obviously, Chinese lockdown, some of the data coming out of there is, is dismal, where you've got about 8% of GDP locked down. Uh, for the, so the first couple of weeks of this month, we have diesel demand on 4%, jet fuel down 48%, building permits for over a million barrels per day of construction. Those are weak, et cetera. Uh, we clear, very clearly demand um, for certain hydrocarbons in Europe is going to be uh, impacted from factory shutting down to energy costs. So we're not saying demand is you know awesome, but it's the mixture between supply and demand which are make, making inventories continuing to fall. This is incredibly impressive to me because it's occurring at a time when you've had the largest re release in history from strategic petroleum reserves by an administration facing a midterm in the next couple of months of which polling data would suggest that they're going to get destroyed. And so a desperate administration does desperate things. They have to get the gasoline price down because there's a very strong inverse correlation between gasoline prices and presidential approval ratings. And so you've, you've had an attack on the oil price, which will be coming to an end. Secondly, we've had this occur with China, the largest driver in incremental oil demand, under a significant lockdown impact of oil demand temporarily that will at some point emerge from that lockdown. So even despite those factors, we have inventories continuing to fall both in absolute terms and relative to normal levels. And so this remains our compass. This gives us the fortitude on days when literally you wake up, pull up Bloomberg very early in the morning and oil's down 5%. And you go onto OTOP on Bloomberg, you check you know, Twitter or other, other sources, and there's literally not an explanation to, to explain it. That's the environment that we're in. And so using oil inventories as our compass allows us to navigate through the volatility, allows us to retain our conviction that our bull thesis remains in place. Even in the United States, both on when you encompass not just oil, but gasoline and distillates, inventories remain uh, at multi, multi-year low levels. And this is also an extraordinary chart to me because what it shows you is that the damage that was inflicted in 2020 from COVID, when the world literally shut down, you look at the magnitude of undersupply relative to that awful, awful time period, and we're in twice of a, of a as bullish or worse situation, depending on your perspective, as we were then. And so we believe that there is a very strong fundamental underpinning for the oil price. This is consensus inventory data because this is from the IEA. It's relatively cheap uh, relative to the Kepler data, which we showed you earlier on, lagged. But what we wanted to show you is that people are not accounting for the SBR release in the data. So I'm seeing you know, on Twitter, oh my gosh, you know, the month of July is the largest increase in inventories, et cetera. But you're accounting for SPR, which is a, a temporary and artificial source of supply that is not sustainable. If you withdraw that to get a better feel for the, how undersupply the market is, inventories have continued to fall to multi, multi, multi-year low levels. And so we've uh, borrowed a chart from Raymond James to, to sh show you, okay, well, what does that pretend for the oil price? They're encompassing a 2 million barrels per day next year of uh, demand. Part of that is China emerging from lockdown at some point, about 42% of that recovery. Embedded in that 2 million uh, barrel per day number is some fuel switching from natural gas to oil. I've seen massive variances in estimates anywhere from 500,000 to a million barrels per day of incremental um, demand. And then also at a time when, and I'll touch on this next, recessions do not mean negative uh, demand. It means a moderation in demand growth. And so if using the 2 million barrel per day, which that may be a little hot, maybe a little, little less than that, that would uh, suggest that on a days of supply basis, uh, an oil price well in excess of $100 by the end 
of next year. And $100 remains our base case. That's what we're used for both stock picking and for financial modeling in the uh, quarters and years ahead. And so we look at the fear of the moment, recession being driven by Fed policy, being driven by an energy crisis in Europe, which the root cause of that was not an invasion by Russia, but really just energy ignorance and incredibly bad planning by ignorant uh, policymakers. And so what does a recession mean? We did a webcast several months ago with an Amrita Sen of Energy Aspects. I would encourage you to uh, go and listen to that again. It, it goes into a lot more detail than what this one graph shows. This is data borrowed from Bernstein. On the left, it shows you recessions do not necessarily mean negative demand growth. They mean a moderation. You'd have to go back to 2020, recency bias, when the world literally shut down. That, that's fairly historic. You'd have to go back to the great financial crisis where you know the, the, the economy, the financial system ground to a halt. Prior recessions, 1980s, kind of a special period to, with uh, hyperinflation. You could argue uh, you know, there are some certain parallels then. I would also say spare capacity with an OPEC was a lot different than it is today. But we're looking at really a moderation in, in demand. Also, the economy today relative to the 70s and 80s is a lot less sensitive to oil. A unit measurement of GDP would mean about 0.3 change in, in oil demand. So the sensitivity to oil to a, a declining economy is not near what it was in prior cycles. This chart is a model from uh, Bernstein. It's not a forecast, but uh, Bob a Bracket of Bernstein did his really, really good work, did a scenario analysis, and he said, look, let's, let's see what the worst case scenario is for oil demand. This is the graph that gives me confidence that I have uh, some longevity in my career as an energy fund, uh, specialist in energy fund, Manager, because what this model shows is that even if we assume ultra aggressive assumptions on electric vehicle adoption, even hydrogen, a moderation in the economy, a moderation in oil intensity per unit of GDP going forward, etc., what this model would suggest is that we have at least a decade's worth of demand growth. And that's this is the worst case scenario. This is in base case, worst case scenario. And so, what does that mean? So the past decade, if you adjust for COVID, demand's been growing by about 1.2 million barrels per day per year. Shave it to a million going forward. 10 years of growth means 10 million barrels of demand growth. We're going to ignore field declines, which uh, Saudi Arabia pegged at 6% just yesterday. Ignore that. We need to come up with 10 million barrels of new productive capacity just to meet demand growth between now and the mid-2030s. The reason why I'm bullish on oil is I cannot identify where those barrels are going to come from. When we look at U.S. shale, we've written about why we are in a post-U.S. shale hyper-growth world. What exactly does that mean? For the past 10 years, had we not had U.S. shale growth, non-OPEC production globally in aggregate would have been roughly flat. And so the energy crisis we are in today, very clearly the oil crisis, and I, this has nothing to do with Russia and Ukraine when I say the oil crisis, the oil crisis that we very clearly are in today, we would have been in several years ago were it not for the rise of U.S. shale growth, where the growth rates exceeded demand growth of the planet. It's what made, made us ride that roller coaster volatility over and over and over again in very short cycles where any time the oil price rallied, Four to six months later, you'd have these guys blow their brains out, go drill. It feels like a kindergarten level conversation to have to have with investors or generalists that say, well, geez, you know, what, is discipline going to stick, et cetera? When are these guys going to go back? Because I've, I've, I've met with enough CEOs over the recent history. I was just at a conference um, about a month and a bit ago with some of the largest shale uh, producers. And I will tell you, the discipline is the new normal. The debate in terms of whether discipline is going to stick it's really moot at this point. And there's a great uh, uh, quote that we took from uh, Rekha Devon from his Q2 conference call. And he goes, unless we have shareholders that come in and say, look, we absolutely want you to grow. We don't like dividends. You know, we run an income fund, which I'll touch on later, where we're getting paid over 10% from dividends. So unless guys like me say, you know what, nah, 10%, we don't like it anymore. We really don't want you to do buybacks. We want you to go and grow. Until we see that quote, I see no reason to change our strategy. It's the reason why we're... we're the oil price was well in excess of $100, and the rate count seems to have plateaued. And so why is that? You know, this is ignores uh, labor. It, it ignores uh, sh still a shortage of ground steel, et cetera. When we look at U.S. shale going forward, the model is not about growth. At best, we're looking at about 5% for the next several years. What we look at is inventory depth of these shale companies. We believe the companies were hydrating throughout the downturn. They were drilling their, some of their very best acreage. 
inventory depth that we have a graph on the left from Raymond James. I've seen another one from Bernstein. It is generally triangulates to around the same thing where within the, the um, uh, Permian, you're looking at anywhere from 10 to 17, 18 years, depending on who you ask. But 18 becomes 10 if you enter into growth mode because you chew through your inventory much, much faster. The other thing we're seeing on the right is that wells are getting gassier. And so for every well drilled, you're getting less and less oil uh, coming from it. And at the same time, for many, many years, we're told about efficiency gains. And every year, you know, wells are getting 5% better. And so even if the rig count and activity stay flat, you were getting that increased in production. Suddenly, you're no longer experiencing uh, well improvement. And in fact, some data, uh, I was trying to find a graph that I, sh- I, sent last, I, I saw last week somewhere, and I, I couldn't find it, but it was pointing to uh, well average productivity falling. Part of that's more privates being in the mix of the rig count, but it also might speak to uh, well uh, quality or the, the, the core of the core having been drilled up. So why is this important? We're not for U.S. shale. The past 10 years, non impact production would have been flat, yet demand had grown by over 10 million barrels per day. The energy crisis that we are now in, we would have already been in. And so the most disruptive influence in the oil market is no more. Yes, we are looking for shale growth of about five to 600,000 barrels per day. Interestingly enough, Production from U.S. shale has been flat for the first five months of this year. We're expecting a bit of an uptick later this year. But it's an absolute necessity. It is a, it is a philosophy, it is a religion amongst boards all around North America, U.S. shale included, obviously, that we must not repeat the sins of the past. What we must do is maximize free cash flow and give it back to shareholders in the form of, bit, of dividends and buybacks. There is not an energy investor on this planet that wants these people, these companies to meaningfully grow. And so the third reason why we're bullish on oil over the short, medium, and long term, other than you know demand growth for the next 10 years, the end of U.S. shale hypergrowth, is a theme we were talking about for, it feels like an eternity. It's been about a year and a half. And we were, and it's, we're kind of simple guy, we're driven by logic and math. And what we were looking at was a scenario where OPEC, as they emerged from you know the COVID trauma, as they were removing curtailed volumes, we saw a scenario that by the end of this year, OPEC would be exhausting their spare capacity, which is basically the insurance policy that we've always had as a world, that if there was a geopolitical event, you know, invasion of a country where there's actually a physical impact to supply, OPEC would always have the barrels to come onto the market and avoid the massive price spikes where you find price discovery to get demand destruction to balance the market. Where we see now is OPEC has basically exhausted their spare capacity. A year ago, that was heretical to even suggest that. Now, what we even have is Secretary Generals of OPEC, the head of Saudi Aramco in speech, which I'm going to highlight in a few slides for now, saying, look, at, we've done the heavy lifting. We have done what we can. The world, they're saying, is 1.5%. You know, that's 1.5 million barrels per day. We, we can debate that, quite honestly, whether that supply uh, exists. Because when we look at, within OPEC, there are the haves and the have-nots. You can't include a country like Venezuela which is you know, over a million barrels per day from high, saying, well, geez, there's all this capacity, right? They only need $85 billion and the company's actually willing to invest in country. So let's look at the haves. We have Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Iraq, and Kuwait as the big four. They are all back to pre-levels uh, where they removed volumes during a f- six-year time period where they had to not violate the social contract with the populace and cut social spending at a time of depressed revenue because of oil prices being low. The easiest thing to cut was spending in productive capacity because you spend money, scarce money today, and you don't get a drop of oil you know, four, five, six years from now. And so, yes, some of these countries are trying to grow capacity. And in fact, they are Saudi Arabia growing capacity by a million barrels per day. It's going to take them till 2027. And importantly, in a shift, they said, that's it. There is no more. That's the level. And that's it. UAE, they're, they're uh, fast tracking, uh, adding capacity by about two years. It's going to be 2000. And 25, that's going to be about 1.2 million barrels per day, I believe. So they've got 2.2 million in gross ads. We're not even talking about further declines from some OPEC countries. And so that leaves me with over the next 10 years of 500,000 barrels per day per year at best, shale half a million or 500, 5 million barrels per day. Within OPEC at best, we think about 2.5 million to inside in UAE. It's not accounting for further declines. And then who's left? Now, we'll touch on that in a second. We put up this speech uh, given by uh, the CEO of Saudi Ramco at uh, the Schlumberger Digital Forum uh, yesterday. This was an unbelievable speech. If you haven't read it, 
read it. I've got it up on Twitter if, uh, if I get off this uh, before you can fully go through it, because it, it does a wonderful job of outlining what is the crisis, how did we get here, and what are the solutions. It's not vilifying the sector. It's not hitting them with excess profit taxes, while at the same time telling them to please grow oil supply, but you know we're going to put you out of business in two years because we have to decarbonize, et cetera. And so it was a it was a very very good speech um, that I don't think I, I would challenge anybody to uh, put out a better uh, description of the the crisis and the challenge that we face uh, as a world because in their words this is why I am seriously concerned it's the warning that they have been giving that we have been giving of the lack of sufficient investment in long cycle supplies the reason why we say we're in a multi year bull market for oil why is it multi year it comes back to cycle time we were relying on short cycle. For U.S. shale, it used to take four to six months. Now it's a long cycle, four to six years. For the most sophisticated oil company on this planet, Saudi Aramco, is taking them five years to add capacity. And so what took us, what has been years in the making will be years in the fixing. And that's why I think we have longevity to a higher oil price as defined as $100 or, or more. And so the math was, okay, the next 10 years, million barrels per day per year, we have to come up with 10 million barrels per day of new capacity. That ignores field declines, which you know, is about 6 million barrels per day. Just set that aside. That's, that's additive to the bull thesis. U.S. shale at best is, is half of that, 5 million barrels per day. Saudi UV is 2.5. That's 7.5. You've got a 2.5 million barrel per day deficit, which doesn't sound like a lot, but the price of oil is set off of that next marginal barrel. And so the only actors left are non-OPEC, non-US producers, Canada, Brazil, Guyana, North Sea, Norway, et cetera. When we look at spending in aggregate by the companies, state companies, the uh, state-owned companies within some of these, the public companies, et cetera, spending peaked in 2014 and it's fallen by half. The oil price is back to where it was in 2014. Spending remains at half. Why? The same demands that we place on Canadian companies, U.S. investors place on shale companies, the, the vilification by ignorant energy policymakers, the necessity to delever, the necessity to increase shareholder returns, dividends, and buybacks, start the starvation of capital necessary for investment, where, again, we see this is about 40% of global oil supply due to that lack of investment, due to the lack of long cycle projects coming on where we've harvested all of the big projects on a net basis. You've got some in Guyana, a couple in Brazil, et cetera, but on a net basis, we see flat production to the end of this decade. And so it's very, very difficult to see how demand balances with supply. Inventories last year were falling. Inventories globally this year have continued to fall despite China under lockdown and the biggest SPR release in history. What happens next year? When the economy continues to improve you know, on, on a net basis, uh, absolute growth at least, even under recession in certain geographies, when China emerges from lockdown, when you've got gas to oil switching of, of as much as a, a million barrels per day, and most importantly, the end of the largest release from SPR, Strategic Petroleum Reserves, in history. And so it's this scenario of imbalance between supply and demand, which we think will continue to lead to declining inventories, therefore putting a meaningfully higher oil, uh, pressure on the oil price. What, okay, so what exactly does this mean for energy stocks? What we show is a graph, this is Canada, we've got a similar one for the US, where due to the abundance of free cash flow, the focus of this year was on deleveraging. You know, companies, are, uh, it's a low to no debt, low to no growth world going forward, where companies either want no debt, or they want, like the most common metric I'm getting from some of my holdings is, well, we want one turn of leverage at $45. Why 45? Well, that's where we were in a pandemic. It can't, you know, on average, it can't get much worse than that. So if we can survive a pandemic, that's that's as much debt as we, we want to be able to take on. And so when we look at 2023 and going forward, we see an environment where shareholder returns are going to meaningfully increase. And I, I would say a lot of people that I, I see on social media and such, they say, well, gee, Eric, you've been chanting buybacks, and that's not really working. That's because very few companies have been practicing the word meaningful. Meaningful to me is 15, 20% buybacks, not five. Five is nothing. Five is boring. And so what I've been doing is I had a, a, a meeting with one of my holdings boards this morning. I've met with prior. I've got others in the next couple of months. And it's the same conversation. Energy stocks are trading near all-time low valuations. I've got a couple charts coming up. We need to awaken people to what I still think is a generational opportunity, which I'm going to define in a couple uh, 
uh, anonymous examples in terms of where we're getting $40 billion literally for nothing. And so get your balance sheet to where you need, whether that's no debt, whether it's one turn or leverage of 45, whatever it is. When you get there, then we're going to have the conversation. And what we're looking for is 75% of the free cash flow to come back to us in the form of returns, you know, which is buybacks or dividends. But look at this, look at how profound the contrast is two years ago till to this, where you had a sector on its knees to suddenly going to be debt free and running very, very low to no debt models going forward. It makes the sector so much more investable because it's it's so much more durable against a price uh, decline. This is a couple of new charts that we just did uh, over the past uh, day. So what we're looking at is a sector which on average, the left is a bar chart showing annual averages. And so many many companies are continuing to hit their leverage metrics. So what we show on the right is the amount of free cash flow is ticking up. So as it goes on. So this is an annual average. You can't just look at uh, a name like White Cap. I saw somebody say, oh, geez, the number's wrong, and et cetera. Well, they're continuing to lever. We, we know where the dividends are increasing on our timing, and we show that on the rates. So that's just one, one example. On the right is important because my belief is that it's the meaningful return of, of, share, of shareholders, uh, free cash flow back to shareholders that will act as the catalyst. And so we can see, well, when is that going to occur on a per company basis? Some companies, I'll, I'll see Sonovus, it's we model them hitting the leverage metric by the end of this year. We see, okay, 100% of free cash flow coming back to us. We can say, well, $100 oil, they're trading at about a 29% free cash flow yield. So we think that's going to be a 10% buyback, a 2% base dividend, and a 17% variable. So we can get paid. 19% in dividends while they buy back 10% of their stock. Others, um, like a Baytex, will say, well, we want to hit you know, uh, 900 million or 800 million as our, our, our initial, and then 400 million as our final. So we can figure out the time. But what this shows you is this is a sector, a wash in free cash flow that has committed to returning the vast majority of it back to shareholders. Why does that matter? So these are graphs on the top will run at 90, on the bottom of 100. These would have been viewed as conservative a couple of months ago. Don't let the weakness in oil be driven off the of fears of a recession, even with falling inventories. Shake you from the belief that once SPR uh, ends in the next couple of months, once China eventually does open, you've got a massive increase in, uh, in demand restoration there. I still believe that we're looking at $100 oil next year. And so what does that mean? We have stocks trading at two and a half times enterprise value cash flow. That's on average. That's skewed obviously by the larger caps that traded a material premium. And importantly, at a 31% free cash flow yield. That's skewed obviously per million on the left with the windfall from European uh, gas prices. But on, on average, what you can see is a sector awash in free cash flow. At the same time, for a, a guy like me, where it's been a game of survivor, uh, we're one of two uh, last men standing, we think, as, as uh, managers of energy funds. This environment is incredible for an active stock picker because, because there are very few participants left, there's no discerning in terms of who should trade at a material premium and who should not. What we're showing is our, our big focus for our fund is on a play called the Clearwater, which is the most economic oil play in North America. We're at $100 oil. You drill a well, it takes one month to get the capital back, and then you've, it's literally a free, you know, free cash flow annuity for that because it's it's unbelievable. Like the old rule used to be a year and a half to get your money back. Now we're talking about plays that in one to three months you get your capital back. It's unbelievable. But what we show on the right are three large holdings, all of which are uh, pure play or generally pure play Clearwater names trading at or below. The average, which makes absolutely no sense. And so as interest level continues to increase in the sector, and we see that happening in real time, both from domestic retails in addition to international uh, institutional interests, because the, it, the opportunity, in my, in my opinion, is obvious. And so what is that opportunity? It's a sector trading at near at or near all-time low valuations. This is courtesy of, of Peters. It's a great graph that shows on EV to DAC, DAC F. So the debt adjusted cash flow, but this is a debt-free sector next year. So it's kind of like EV to, to cash flow, which is what I've shown you before, which on a, for the juniors especially, trading at a modest premium to two times, the intermediates, even the seniors trading at very, very attractive levels. And so why is this? One, volatility has been a killer. You know, the, the oil price falling from 120 to 80 at a time when global inventories have continued to fall have made some of us uh, you know, kind of scratch our heads. I, energy Aspects held a webcast with Pierre Anderand, who 
up until my performance in 2021 held, uh, I believe, the record for the best one-year return of energy and any energy in, uh, fund in history. Very, very well-respected gentleman. And the punchline was, you know, Amrita who's hosting was like, no, these fundamentals are strong for all of these reasons, which we've touched on. Can you explain the oil price collapse? I mean, you, the punchline was basically said, I don't get it. You know, you can explain it away to recessionary fears, lack of of uh, traders wanting to um, uh, utilize capital because it gains in the first half and increased volatility, recessionary fears, SPR, all of these different things, policy risk uh, with Iran uncertainty, Russia uncertainty, all of these different things. But the punchline is energy stocks remain extremely inexpensive. This is a debt-free sector in the coming quarters. They are pledging low to no growth, and yet they're awash in cash. And so when we when we look at the uh, timeline to privatize for these companies, you know, at hundred dollar oil, the average company in Canada can privatize in just over four years from free cash flow. And yet when we look at our fund, our average holding is about 20 years of stay flat inventory. And so my mind is I get a 20 years of, of production, therefore 20 years of free cash flow, and I'm only paying for four of them. And so I'm getting 16 years of free cash flow for free. Shave $10 off from 100 to, to 90, and you're basically just adding one year uh, onto that. And so why am I such a proponent of buybacks? Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of people like the dividends, et cetera, they like variables. My own, my own belief is you can't value what you can't measure. Uh, my analyst and I, we have uh, almost every company in North America modeled out. So I can show you production cash flow between 70 and 120. We can figure out the cash flow, what it's worth, et cetera. Very few people are willing to put in the time and effort to do that. And so you can't tell me the debt in a $90 oil, 110 is going to be doing this variable because this is their, their recipe for free cash flow. This is how they define free cash flow. This is what they're going to be paying it out. So this is what it should be valued, et cetera. Versus a, a buyback, it's it's simple, but it's powerful logic. And so this is an example. This would be our, our largest holding. It's a pure play mid-cap oil sand company. And so it, it's it's simple because it's, it's a very elegant example. This is a company with 35 years of reserves. So think of it as they, you have a 35-year annuity of free cash, but because today they're trading at about a 31%, 32% free cash yield, they can privatize in three years. They've said, we're, we have an ultimate debt target. We're going to hit it by a key three-ish of next year, at which point we're getting 100% of the free cash flow. They've pledged that. And so we can say with reasonable confidence, and that's going to be all buybacks, that you know, this, the, at the constant share price, that's a, key, that's a key part that I'm going to touch on in a second. At the constant share price, they're gone in three years. Well, what does that mean? If I'm only paying for three years of production, therefore I'm only paying for three years of free cash flow, I'm getting 32 years of free cash flow for free. And yet this is a company that's going to free cash flow $1.4 billion a year. So 32 times 1.4, it's roughly $40 billion of free cash flow i.e. a dividend, you know, you got to spread it over time, of course, you've got a discount, but there's $40 billion of value sitting right here on my desk. So my question to you and the questions to the board, the question to the board that I asked this morning was, what is the value of that last share? It's a $18 share price right now. And so if the company is meaningful and bold and they go and aggressively buy back in just 3.3 years, and if the share price doesn't go up, the, what's the value of that last year? Well, it's $40 billion minus a discount. So you're going to say, Eric, you're, you're, you're clearly smoking something. That's insane. Because there can't, one, there can't be that free much value, free value, or two, of course, the share price is going to go up. And that's exactly the point that I make. Of course, in my opinion, the share price is going up. So a board can drive that re-rating. When I talk about privatization, I do not expect any company to privatize because I expect the re-rating and the share price as the share price goes on it elongates the amount of time to privatize. But the ultimate result is I don't have to have a general investor care for this sector ever again. Decarbonization, sunset industry, blah, like all of the noise that we hear. Forget it. As long as the sector is meaningful and bold in returning free cash flow back to us, which I would say that is where we are today. And I can say that with, with confidence because I'm meeting with boards actively as I did this morning. That's where the mindset is and the conviction is because that the logic of this argument, I think, is one uh, I would say everyone over. It's the meaningful and in unison action of the sector to return cash to buy back stock aggressively that, in my opinion, will drive a re rating in share prices to result in more than 100% upside in stocks from current levels. And so we have two funds where they are trying to um, 
uh, solve two different problems. We had historically only had one. It was the Nine Point Energy Income Fund. It was the number one traditional energy fund in 2019 and 2021. So we're the best in the world too the past three years. I'll touch on that in a second. We recently launched an income fund, which I'm really, really excited about. And it's, it's exciting because it takes advantage of a few things. One is the inefficiency of the sector, where very few people can look at all the companies, can model out production free cash flow at 70, 80, 90, 100, 120, figure out, okay, what kind of variable dividend is that going to be, and populate a portfolio where you're getting extreme, uh, in my opinion, extremely attractive dividends. We would measure that after withholding tax, because about 80% of the fund is US, the fund pays 15% withholding tax. We're, we're generating about 8.4% of pre-expense income from dividends. So pretty good, but it doesn't stop there. So this is obviously a very volatile sector. And so the other strategy is to sell covered calls on the entire fund on about a one month basis. We've just been writing up October's, we showed the results on the right. And what this means is that while we are capping our upside on a one month basis, on average at about 16%, so at, at worst, we get called away in the entire fund a month from now, we, we only make 16% capital appreciation as an income investor, it's not terrible but we still keep the base dividends, the variable dividends, and the option premium. And that's the where the power is. We're getting paid on average so far to date on an annualized basis, 16%. And so if we can continue to do this every month of the year, and the, the volatility premium doesn't go down, the volatility of the sector ought to go down, it's, it's difficult to imagine. What I can tell you is historically, if we can continue on the six months so far of doing this, we're generating 16% cash on cash returns from writing the, the calls, and we're generating about 8% in uh, pre-expense after withholding tax dividend income. So that's about 24% actual cash on cash yield that we're generating. We are paying out right now about a 6.5% uh, yield, a 7% on the, on the um, initial uh, offering. And so there will be a true up by the end of this year versus what we've generated so far this year. Now, keep in mind, we launched this in um, uh, March, April. So that annualized number I'm talking about is annualized. We haven't achieved that. But when I look to 2023, on an annualized basis, uh, we feel pretty comfortable. Uh, I, in my opinion, we can generate greater than a 10% cash uh, return to you, um, given what we've been experiencing and, and achieving uh, so far to date. And these are the results in mind. So it, it's an extremely unique product. And it's leveraging our ability and our stock picking. So you get the benefit of buying into mispriced stocks. You get the benefit of, of us populating a fund where you're getting the highest variable returns. And then the options strategy is, is a pain in the butt to do because volatility and, and uh, liquidity can be an issue. We're the largest energy fund in the country. So we, we can, um, uh, that assists us in getting uh, ample liquidity and good pricing on the options. And so we're making almost two times on the option book what we are on the income. So it's, I'm, I, I, I was pretty confident that it was going to be a great strategy. We're achieving results that are even in excess of what I thought we would do. And I always tell my holdings, the management teams, set the bar of expectations low and always beat them. And so when we came out our initial yield, we increased it by 40%. We see the ability to, to increase it potentially um, in the, the future. Nine Point Energy Income Fund, uh, it's the, again, as I referenced, uh, we've been the best energy fund in the world, according to Morningstar, to the past three uh, years. We're in Canada year to date, uh, number one fund. We've got about a 13% lead uh, relative to whom I consider to be my only remaining uh, competitor. And the strategy is to uh, populate the fund. We have about uh, 13 holdings now, 13, 14 holdings. And we populate the fund with holdings where we see profound mispricing, we would estimate our average holdings trading about 2.4 times enterprise value cash flow at $100 oil and trading at about a 28% free cash flow yield next year at $100 oil. And we would expect to get 75% of that on average from our holdings in the form primarily in buybacks and also in, in variable dividends depending on the holding. And so whether you're looking to maximize Income, we have the Nine Point Energy Income Fund. It's listed on the NEO exchange under the ticker NRGI, Energy, uh, or NRGI. And then the Energy Fund, which um, you know we, we, we work very, very hard at trying to put the most amount of performance up on the board. And I'm very, very proud of the results that we've, we've achieved for 
our clients. That's also available in mutual fund or it's available on the NEO exchange under NNRG. And so whether you're looking again for maximum income or maximum potential upside uh, capture, we feel like we've got two excellent, excellent products uh, for you. And so with that, I went on a little longer uh, than I intended, but uh, I'm going to turn it over to Neil, where we have uh, questions that have been submitted. And as well, I believe you can still submit questions in the, uh, the box on, the, I think it's the bottom of your screen. So uh, thank you again for your time and let's uh, open it up to questions. Eric, we had many questions in advance. Um, the, obviously, we do want to sort of stay away from individual securities and picks a little bit here, but uh, I've kind of aggregated some of the key themes from the, the larger list. Um, you spoke a little bit about this, but uh, I'll ask the question because I think um, maybe we can go a little deeper. Um, but just some questions around uh, how far would you project the price of oil to fall if the world goes into recession or because of increasing interest rates? Maybe you want yeah. to just speak on that a little bit more? So let's, let's re remember that periods of negative demand growth are extremely rare. Uh, I'm going to reference a few people whose opinion I respect. Energy aspects is modeling a recession, a deep recession in Europe, recession in the U.S., I think the second half of next year. They have oil demand growth of eight or 900,000 barrels per day. Uh, Mike Rothmer of Cornerstone, he just came out with a piece this morning. I believe they're using 1.3 million barrels per day of demand growth. That's with no fuel switching. Um, and so it's not just about demand, but that's also the challenges on supply. It's where U.S. shale producers are under uh, extreme pressure to increase uh, our pay variables. It's about OPEC that's exhausted spare capacity, not just according to Eric, but according to the former and current Secretary General of OPEC and you know the head of Saudi Aramco, and also a world where the super majors haven't been investing for eight years now, and they're not growing. So you can't just focus on demand. That is the profound and I think will be costly mistake. You've got to look at the two drivers of price of anything. It's not just demand, but it's supply. And it's the intersection of those two things, what it means for inventories, that ultimately will drive the price. You know, the financial demand uh, for oil can dictate the price and excess volatility in the short term. Ultimately, it's the physical market, it's fundamentals that, that win out in the end. And so that's what we continue to focus on. Here's a question. Uh, what kind of catalyst will be effective to counteract the persistent and incorrect media coverage about supply growth and or demand destruction? It's going to be price, you know, ultimately a higher price where I see journalists feeding narratives to try to justify the day-to-day -day price move, which most of the time is impossible, you know, like literally, because the volatility you now is just it's unbelievable and it's, it's off the charts from a historical perspective. So it's going to be the exhaustion of OPEX for capacity, which either we're there today or we're there pretty darn soon. Because whether Saudi has, you know, they're producing 11, some people think sustainable is 10.7 when you exclude drawing down from their own internal inventories. If you use surge capacity of 12, which some people would say, well, you know, it, it's not sustainable, even if you go there, you know, that takes you, that's, that's not even one year of demand growth. And then even Saudi's out. And whether you have capacity, if you're not wanting to bring it on unless there's an actual physical shortage it's ineffective regardless. Uh, from the demand perspective, I think China emerging from lockdown at some point, and none of us, like, let's be honest, none of us can call that from a time perspective, obviously. I, I would just, the logic would suggest that you're, you're, you're risking social uh, um, disobedience if you continue it on, where you've got 8% of GDP under lockdown right now. If not, you know, this hasn't been a two week uh, time period that they've been experiencing food shortages and getting rotten food from the government and such. And so, at whatever time the market, believes that that the COVID zero policy is abandoned or is lessening, that I think is 10 to $20 in, in the oil price. That's been really, really uh, destructive to sentiment. The SPR ending, it's a volumetric thing where, you know, it was thought to be um, uh, end of October. Now it's potentially end of November to early December. Whenever the heck it does end, it, it should be by year end for reasons about uh, cavern uh, stability whether it's, you know, you're, you're, you've drawn down the medium and heavies by over 50%, I think the lowest level since 84 or something like that, you, you've removed the political pressure to get the gasoline price down. Because let's face it, you know, it's a wartime initiative, biggest release in history from SBRs. That was supposed to counteract the big, big drop in volumes out of Russia. 
Russian volumes have been barely changed. I think they're down to three or four hundred thousand barrels per day. So I think you'd, you'd have to be only the, the, the ultra non-skeptic would say this has not been for purely political reasons. You get past the midterm, which is the, the reason why, in my, belief, in my opinion, they've been trying to massacre the gasoline price. We're past that. So those are a few imminent catalysts, I think, that you're going to help shift the, the, the narrative um, around, oh, my God, you know, we're, we're getting plunged into a deep recession. It's all over for, for a while. And I'm going to write a column in the, one of my next columns in the Financial Post. I'm going to write it probably next week, and it'll be, you know, can you be bullish on oil and energy stocks in a recession? So I'm, I'm going to, I'll try to give you some more uh, uh, data points on that. Variety of questions asking about M&A activity in the sector. Um, yeah. Asked different ways, but it's uh, certainly something people are interested in. Can you speak to that? Yeah. I don't want m and I don't want my companies to be bought. I don't want my companies necessarily to buy. I don't want them to necessarily buy only with ex- exceptions. And there was one uh, recently because it creates a, hang- a, a hangover on your um, on your stock if it's private equity guys that are taking your stock, which is usually the reason why they come, some companies are selling. You know, it's end of life for PE funds. Every dollar leaving private equity, there's only 15 cents coming in. So these guys need to raise capital at the end of life. And I don't want companies to buy unless they have an inventory problem. If they have an inventory problem, I probably don't own them because I don't want to have my free cash flow taken away from me because I feel extraordinarily strong that that is the identifiable and high confidence catalyst that is going to lead to the re-rating. And trust me, I, I know people have, oh my God, I've been waiting 80 years for it and all this stuff, but... The theme this year has been about mar- you know, marginal, but some, some return to equity guys, but it's been returned to the bondholders by deleveraging, return to the banks. When this, this sector is debt-free, potentially Q1 of next year on average, it's now our turn, and it's our turn to get paid. And so I don't want a company to take that free cash away from me to go use it on M&A and say, oh, trust us, trust us, you know, in, in two quarters from now, you're going to get paid. There's exceptions to that. There was one recently, but it's an exception. Eric, you spoke about it on one of the last slides, um, but I did want to come back to the Energy Income Fund. Um, Our view is that um, investing in oil and gas equities is a specialty area. And even if you happen to be an advisor or investor that's, you know, buying, you know, choosing your own bank stocks or choosing your own utility stocks, that oil and gas production is a specialty area and inherently lends itself to uh, specialist and active management. Um, we have two funds, um, one older than the other, the energy fund. Um, we've talked about it quite a bit. But uh, when you look at how you manage the energy income fund and the ETF, NR- uh, NRGI, which is the same fund, um, it really is a special fund and something that is that the portfolio is managed in a way that would really be difficult for a Canadian advisor or Canadian investor, uh, I think, to duplicate. Could you maybe just speak to that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, there's a few reasons for um, for that. So putting in the, the effort where we we are relying on ourselves. We do all of our own work. We do 99% of our own homework. And so what does that mean? We have almost every company in North America modeled out, um, out for the next couple of years. We can figure out, okay, production, production trajectories, free cash flow, rate of change, where if you do your own work, you know, you can identify like one of our big wins last year for the other for the, the, the mothership fund was, you know, we bought 9.9% of Athabasca when oil was at 53 because our own work said, well, geez, if oil goes from 53 to 60, free cash flow flex by 10x, suddenly the world will view this through a very different lens and we can get, you know, meaningful re-rating. We made a, a fortune on that. We couldn't have done that if I'm relying on a bank to put out, you know, on their price deck and what they think is... Analysts, in my opinion, not all, there are some good analysts, but many of them are more focused on job preservation than they are for ultimately making their clients money. And so if we were reliant on banks, if you're an advisor at a bank, well, you're very clearly not doing this. If you are, you shouldn't be. And so it's it's an incredible investment of time and capital to do that. And at the same time, it's extraordinarily laborious to be figuring out, like we've got uh, uh, Colin Watson who helps us in the option strategy. He does a, a great job. And he's got more complex models that goes over my head half of the time. But in terms of, okay, where should we be writing and then contacting, you know, marketing it out to different banks, competitive attention on pricing, et cetera. It's a lot of time. And it's a pain in the, I can't say the words uh, on a webcast, but 
to, to run, but it's the result that's great. But should, would you want to be doing that to try to get ample liquidity, modeling out companies, figuring out where to be writing, et cetera? I'm, I'm very, very confident in the value add that we're providing uh, from that. And that, in my opinion, the results so far are speaking for themselves. I'm told I was muted. Eric, I think we're going to leave it there. We've uh, you've covered a lot of things that were in the questions, and um, and uh, I think we'll leave it there. And maybe we'll see if you have some final remarks, and uh, we'll say our goodbyes. Well, one, we've got Fed in seven minutes, so I know people's attention are maybe on other things. But I, I deeply appreciate your time. I am uh, sensitive to the volatility uh, that we've had both in, in oil and energy stocks over the past months. I know the frustrations of having your clients call you because you call me or some, in some cases your clients contact me and they say, Eric, like, what the heck is going on? And so I, I know that level of, of, of volatility eats away at your conviction. We try our best to take emotion and set it aside. We did it successfully or somewhat successfully in 2020 when panic was, was, was very, very palpable. And so we try to use logic and data um, and math to, to direct us. And what it tells us is there is a deep fear of recession that's obvious. It is not having an impact now on inventories, which are the, the underlying fundamentals of oil. Yes, the financial market for oil can, can you know, vacillate on a daily basis in the short term, but ultimately it's physical market that matters. And when we look to where we think oil just was and where it's heading, I am so unbelievably excited by a sector that is incredibly inefficient because there's none of us left to stock pick. A sector that is debt free next year, where they have bought into the philosophy of not meaningfully growing and instead maximizing free cash flow returning to us. And when I can chart that out where we can get paid by buybacks and dividends 20, 30, 39% in some cases, that's incredibly exciting because finally we have the catalyst. And you know, as bad as it, it feels, there was a bit of a drawdown. You know, the energy index, we're, we're up roughly at, we're up 45% year to date relative to the S&P down 18 or 19%. Like it, it's, it hasn't been terrible this year, but we think we've got even better days. And so as, as always, I, I especially appreciate the confidence that you place in myself and my team. We wake up every single morning trying to think of how we can make you that incremental dollar and outperform. And we are extremely hungry to, to maximize the upside from what we think is a five, six, seven year or longer uh, bull market for oil and, and energy at large. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for investing an hour of time with us, and we hope you have a fantastic rest of the day.